test
Communities Enforcement Committee. Therefore, I take this opportunity foremost um, to extend a very warm welcome to our guests of honor this morning, um, the Vice Council of Kampa Hotel Chinese Surgeon Chinese Medicine, Dr. Ranjan and Council Miraka, Her Excellency Janita Eliyanke, uh, Ambassador of Sri Lanka to the Russian Federation, Emeritus Professor Gandhi Sanjay, former Vice Chancellor, Minister of Government, Keynote Speaker. As well as an immense guidance, the following prominent individual paved the way for the success of this event today. It is with great privilege that I now invite 
the Vice Chancellor mm -hmm. of the Gampa Vikramarish University of Indigenous Medicine, Professor Randini Vikram Senviratnam, to address this gathering. Excellency, Professor Janita Yerebu, on the incident to partial preparation for the best of honor. Emeritus Professor Ravi Seranayakan, on the best of honor. And uh, Senior Professor Gamini Radhapaksha, the keynote speaker, and Dr. Amrita Jayatilaka, the symposium chair, deans, academics, non academics, and students of Nampa Utumat University of Indian Medicine, and all distinguished invitees. As the current Vice Chancellor of Nampa Utumat University of Indian Medicine, it's my privilege to address all of you at the beginning. Of International Research Symposium on Multidisciplinary Approaches in Indigenous Knowledge Systems 2024, date of which falls on the third anniversary of our university. We are honored to have three eminent, in fact, unique academic personalities with us. The first Vice Chancellor of Dampa uh, Kumar University, Professor Jayantan Yenagi, without whose determination and untiring effort, this university would not have become a reality. And then, Professor Gamani Senanayaka, the former Vice Chancellor of the University of Ruhuna, who is well known for his humanity, patriotism, and pragmatism, a role model for me and many others from the University of Ruhuna, and I wish many Sri Lankans would emulate his three strength when champion. Senior Professor Gamani Rajapaksha, a pioneer academic in the field of nanotechnology in Sri Lanka. We need to appreciate his efforts in spreading this important science across many fields in order to make human activities more efficient. In other words, extracting more from what we do and what we have. This is a key uh, requirement in the modern world where uh, population is increasing, there are wants and needs increasing, and with the resources dwindling. The Pyfluent University was launched with the intention of becoming a center of excellence in education, research, innovation, through harmonization of indigenous knowledge systems with modern sciences towards sustainable development. In a sense, it has fallen on us to scientifically prove existing contents in indigenous knowledge by sending it through the sieve of Western research methodology, which is accepted as the gold standard by the law. Since the commencement of the university and even before, attempts in this direction have been made. However, the scope, quality, and quantity of such efforts really benefit from enhancement. And it's the duty of our university to do so. Uh, for above reasons, today's symposium occupies the foremost place in my heart, as I consider it's my primary responsibility not only for Gampa Kumar University of Indian Medicine, but the nation to enhance output of the research related to indigenous medicine, indigenous sciences. Indigenous medicine, the primary concern in Gampa Kumar University is different from Western medicine. Indigenous medicinal approaches incorporate health and happiness of human beings in a holistic manner. It views and addresses both preventive side and the treatment aspects. In the broad sense, indigenous sciences and indigenous knowledge systems were thought more appropriate as primary objective of this university than indigenous medicine, the name which sounds too narrow to what it incorporates. At an individual level, indigenous systems have techniques to address emotions, thoughts, words, and actions of human beings of all ages, allowing them to lead contented, contented and productive life, even in the middle of turmoil, such as the situation our nation is in today. 
these techniques range from mantras, counseling, yoga, panchatama, dietary schedules, angampura, massage, name a few. At the national level, health and happiness involves education, agriculture, economy, security, governance, and many other aspects, all of which are covered by indigenous knowledge systems via their own methodology. This wide scope is well addressed in the mandate uh, of the university, which provides room for fields of medicine, technology, science, management, and social sciences. Objective is to amalgamate best of Eastern and Western sciences to innovate products better than both could provide alone. Therefore, the potential exists for the university and academics to get engaged in wide spectrum and research activities in collaboration with other institutions. This has the potential benefit to our nation as well as the mankind at large. While thanking our chief guest, keynote speaker, symposium chair, and the organizing committee, once again, I wish this conference every success. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for the unparalleled support tender. Started in 1929 by Ayurveda Chakravarti Pandit GP Vikramarachi with 20 students, the Gampa Vikramarachi Ayurveda Institute was popular as a center for teaching in the Ayurveda tradition of medicine in Sri Lanka. With a proud history of over 95 years, the institute has educated many local and international students on indigenous medicine. Shardari became the kind of responsibility of making this institution a national university. The role played by the founding vice chancellor, Senior Professor Chanita, earlier and again, is consistently commended. As the pioneer who worked tirelessly in establishing GWUIM, Senior Professor Lian again did an incomparable and invaluable service to the university, ensuring the creation of an environment. That is on par with international standards. Currently, having embarked on a diplomatic mission, Her Excellency Senior Professor Janita Elianegi serves as the Ambassador Extraordinary and Plenipotential of Sri Lanka to the Russian Federation with concurrent accreditation to the Republic of Belarus. Despite her hectic schedules, Her Excellency Hartel's wishes are always shared with the GWUIM community. Today, her Excellency, Senior Professor Janita Kalyanagi, has raised this event virtually as a guest of honor. Thus, I consider it a great honor to invite Her Excellency to share her valuable thoughts. Good morning to all of you. I bow and uh, so first of all, I'm very thankful for inviting me for this valuable uh, occasion, the second international symposium on harnessing indigenous uh, knowledge for the sustainable development of Sri Lanka. And at the uh, third anniversary of the Gampa Vikramarachi University of Indigenous Medicine. So, Professor Ranjan, uh, Ranjan Seneviratna, the current Vice Chancellor of the University, Emirates Professor Gamini uh, Senanayaka, the former Vice Chancellor of Yuhuna University, and uh, my colleague at uh, Peradeniya University Senior Professor Gamini Rajapaksha, who is a great chemist, and the symposium chair and the organizing committee and all participants uh, of the symposium. Indigenous knowledge is not only uh, valuable to Sri Lanka, but also for uh, 
the whole world. And especially uh, Sri Lankan indigenous knowledge is now becoming, uh, you know, very valuable. When you are in another country and when you are visiting, you know, uh, universities in uh, other countries, you can uh, feel it and you can uh, see the value of this, our indigenous knowledge. So actually uh, using scientific ways to harness the indigenous knowledge of our country, it is not only for the uh, sustainable development of uh, Sri Lanka, it is for the whole world. So uh, I'm so happy uh, that the university is going, moving uh, according to the vision of the university uh, when we uh, establish it and collecting all the, uh, you know, in, uh, researchers and uh, everybody uh, for things like, you know, to exchange knowledge uh, like this, having this international symposium uh, annually. So uh, I'm so thankful to everybody, in, uh, starting from the Vice Chancellor, current Vice Chancellor, for allowing and for, for organizing this uh, very valuable uh, symposium, very valuable symposium. Today, uh, it is the third anniversary day of the university. And we established this university in the uh, on the first of March in 2021. It's a memorable day, not only for us, uh, for the university. It is it is a memorable day for the whole country, as establishing and in and adding another national university to the Sri Lanka university system. And this is actually this uh, university is um, established. To, uh, to enhance the knowledge and it is now using all the knowledge of indigenous knowledge, not only indigenous knowledge and also uh, indigenous uh, medical systems and also uh, using all the necessary uh, other, other fields like uh, IT, biomedical systems, uh, management, social science and uh, social sciences, and uh, you know, uh, other agricultural, indigenous agricultural systems and all. So actually speaking, I'm, I'm so proud of this university because when I can, I can talk about this university very proudly in other countries and uh, even uh, these country, uh, the other countries are also very, uh, you know, very happy about our indigenous system, and they are willing to cooperate with this university. So uh, I hope this, and I wish this uh, symposium a very success, and also uh, you will continue this. Uh, so continue this annually at the anniversary day and I'm trying my best to uh, collaborate, arrange collaborations with this university and uh, other universities in the world uh, to enhance the quality and uh, the uh, standards of this university. So having this uh, the scientific way. There are eminent scientists. I can say at the uh, at the head table, our Professor Gamini Seranayaka, who is a great agriculturist and uh, very eminent professor, and also Professor Gam uh, Professor Gamini R Rajapaksha, who is always having uh, you know in introducing scientific way of doing things. So this is the way that this university has to go. So it, 
harnessing indigenous knowledge, not only harnessing indigenous knowledge, to conduct everything in the scientific way is the way to way, go forward. So, so, uh, so thank you very much, uh, Professor Seranayaka and also Professor Rajapaksha uh, for attending this and helping this university. Uh, although I'm here, I'm just, my heart is always uh, with this university. So uh, thank you very much once again. And I wish and uh, I wish this symposium be a very fruitful one and wish you all a very fruitful day. Thank you very much once again. Thank you, dear madam, for your heartiest wishes extended. Your guidance motivates us in every aspect. We would also like to acknowledge the generous contributions made by the following sponsors for the 2024 National Savings Bank Capital, South Savvy Bookshop, The Advent Trading Private Limited, Pitech Technology, NOAA Biomedical Systems Private Limited, Microtech Biological Private Limited, Marpada Private Limited. Emeritus Professor Gami Sinanaika's profile boasts of an illustrious career where he has held notable positions as the chairman of the Sri Lanka Council for Agriculture Research Policy, the Vice Chancellor of the University of Lumina, as well as being the chairman of the expert committee under the Presidential Secretariat to develop a policy framework to modernize the agriculture sector a position he continues to hold to date. Professor Sainanayaka was the first Sri Lankan to win the Science and Technology Award of Japan in 1993. As an expert in the field of agricultural biology, Professor Sainanayaka has published in over 200 articles in numerous journals, local and international proceedings. He also performs his duties as the governing board member of the Postgraduate Institute of Agriculture, University of Peradeniya, among many other responsibilities. It is with great honor that I now invite Emeritus Professor Gamini Senanayaka to address the gathering. Good morning to all of you. Uh, Vice Chancellor, Professor Bandini, Professor Nivakna, the guest of honor, Her Excellency, Professor Janita Dianagi, keynote speaker, Senior Professor Damini Sanke Paksar, uh, Conference Secretary, Dr. Tia Vijaysinha, the Dean of the Faculties, Registrar, Mr. Chanter and all the professors, academic, non academic staff, and all the participants. It is my pleasure to raise this very important occasion uh, due to many reasons. One is uh, I'm really happy with the progress of this university under the leadership of Professor. Ratna, who is in my staff at the University of Puruna. And uh, so when I came to know that he had been appointed as the Vice Chancellor, I was very happy that his contribution can be given to the Nadir University. And, uh, and uh, of course, uh, the conference chair, Dr. Amalika, I know her from her childhood. So those are the reasons. And the other important reason is I love indigenous knowledge. So one of my, my paper I published on indigenous knowledge systems for sustainable development is one of the highest citations I've been recorded. When I check today morning, 
this over 270 citations from all over the world. That means the world is looking for this knowledge base. So therefore, this university has a big task to perform. So why this conference is important on today's context? So we know that indigenous knowledge system of uh, is uh, adapting. We are the knowledge generated by ourselves, our ancestors, when we are trying to adapt to our environment to fulfill our requirements from the environment without ex over exploiting the environment and without hurting the environment. So that is why it is more important today than uh, earlier. But the other important thing is this indigenous knowledge is a very special kind of knowledge. It is not universal. It's a location specific. It is time specific and it is culture specific. So if someone is trying to uh, transfer this knowledge to a new environment, it will suffer from the, this dislocation effect. So therefore, we have to be very careful in the using this uh, indigenous knowledge. The other thing is indigenous knowledge is a people science. It has not been developed by the great scientists at the laboratories by doing experiments. So it's, it's the ordinary person's science. But they have developed this testing on the real world over time through trial and error and therefore if you do an experiment in the laboratory, we control the environment. We do statistical analysis. We control the covariance uh, and uh, all those things. Then we get very significant results. And then we can publish a very big, good research article. But when we are going to apply that findings in the real world, the, you can't control the variation. So the significant results will be masked by the variations. Therefore, the people will not use it. But if you test it in the real world, under real conditions, without any control, if they show the results, that means it will show results anywhere else. So that is the beauty of it. So why this conference is under this world? Why it is important? Now, uh, what I want to tell is uh, the Western world, the Western concept, they talk about the pluralism. They talk about the pluralism in uh, languages, pluralism in culture, pluralism in religion, and ethnic, ethnicity, everything. But they don't talk about the pluralism in science. They think only the Western science should be. Uh, the only science in the world. They don't like to talk on the tourism in science, but they have to accept there's a science in the this part of the world. Now, if you go to the Mahavansa, if you read the Mahavansa, that's a uh, chapter, uh, a king called Adga Gemunu or the Amanda Gamini, uh, was rule in this country uh, before uh, uh, the nine, if I could remember correctly, uh, 19 years BC. Uh, he has, he had put up a uh, lightning arrestor to the Mahastupa, the Ruan Manisa, it's called Vajra Chumbata. In our textbooks, we teach that uh, lightning arrest has been found 200 years ago by Benjamin Franklin by sending a kite to the uh, sky. And that is how it is. That is how it was taught to our students. But it has been used by this country through indigenous knowledge over 2000 years ago. That is the truth. So, therefore, I think. What is this is why it has happened 
during the 19th century, under because of the effect of the colonialism, our education system has been turned down, upside down, and so therefore we taught only the uh, Western science. So therefore, I think uh, it is high time now to get this. Uh, Western, our own knowledge, our indigenous knowledge, back to the platform. So this conference will be a very good platform for all the scientists, so-called Western scientists and the scientists in the East Bloc can meet together, can have a very interactive session, and we can develop something new. Because this university is unique for that. But no other university in the country to study this, this indigenous knowledge system. So uh, I finish this with one example. My father, my father is a Ayurvedic doctor, and uh, he died about uh, 13 years ago uh, at the age of 99. And uh, my home. Oh, is in a small mountain, and my father's dispensary is at the foot of the mountain, and we have 70 odd steps to climb to go to our home. So when my father treat, treated a patient, and the last test he did is he asked the patient to come to my ancestors place, my home, without support of anyone, by climbing these 70 odd steps. Then once he climbed up, he checked the pulse of, you know, the Nadi Balana, and no laboratory test, nothing, by counting these pulses, he will say whether he is recovered or not. That is the science that we have. Now we go for laboratory tests. I'm sorry, Dr. Ranjana, uh, I'm not blaming the Western medicine, but we have a parallel alternative medicine system, no way second to this Western medicine. So now it is coming up as the hell is common. So therefore, this university can do a lot of research on that. We can get foreign students to this uh, university. I remember that uh, when I was working as a professor at the Faculty of Agriculture at the University of Rohana. I developed a course module for indigenous knowledge systems in agriculture. That was very popular at that time. And a lot of foreign students, especially from Netherlands and Germany. I got students down to my university just to follow this course module and get the credit and that credit was transferred to their university. So they are in that way, you can develop some modules which can be marketed in the world, and that will be a good income for the university as well as it will improve the visibility of the university. So therefore, this conference, I am really happy about this, and I hope that during this conference, you can have a very interactive session about the research findings, and I wish all the best for all the participants and paper presenters. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for your inspiring talk, Shah. A prominent figure in Sri Lankan academia who has more than three decades of service has joined us in 2024 as the keynote speaker. He's none other than Senior Professor Kalamin Rajapaksha, an expert in physical chemistry and nanotechnology. A senior academic from the University of Praira Delia, he has performed as a visiting lecturer, visiting lecturer at universities in Sri Lanka and abroad, including the University of Liverpool, University of Shizuka, Japan, and the University of Mississippi, USA. With numerous publications and patents, he's also the founding professor of Sri Lanka Institute of Nanotechnology. Senior Professor Roger Paksha received the Presidential Award and National Science Foundation Awards in various years. He is also a member of numerous professional associations, including being a council member 
at the National Academy of Sciences, Sri Lanka. Thus, I consider it a great privilege to invite Senior Political Army Raju Paksha to deliver the keynote speech on nanotechnology and its contribution to the sustainable development of Sri Lanka. Good morning to all of you. It's great. Uh, Professor Ranjan uh, Sanyalaka, uh, the leader of the world front, that is how you remember him. And uh, uh, I'm so pleased to uh, meet him today, and also my good colleague, Damini, and also all these distinguished colleagues, uh, students, and ladies and gentlemen. It's really a privilege and honor for me to deliver this. Uh, uh, keynote address, uh, despite I've been a person in different discipline, this uh, indigenous medicine is in my heart because my Atta grandfather was the uh, the village's weather master. And when we were young, actually, we never, I mean, without any like a for uh, like a flu or any little illness, we always had this treatments from Atta. And also, when I was in London, when I was doing my PhD at the Imperial College, followed by post of course, six years, uh, those days winter flu is very common, and uh, there was no flu shot. And only medicine that worked for me is venomous. So I'm um, sort of uh, this indigenous med medicine is in my heart. So without taking much of your time, I only half an hour. So I'll go into this one, uh, my presentation on nanotechnology and its role in advancing the sustainable development agenda of Sri Lanka. Okay, All right, so I'll give a very brief introduction to nanotechnology. So nanotechnology is the manipulation of matter in the nano scale, which means from one nanometer to 100 nanometers, at least in one nanometer. So one nanometer is one billionth of a meter. So one billionth means we can't see them, but we need to have an electron microscope to see these particles. Uh, light microscope, uh, optical microscope cannot uh, uh, see these, uh, cannot be used to see these particles. But however, you know, atoms and molecules are much smaller than these. We are manipulating atoms and molecules, but atoms are, and molecules are sub nanometer, like angstrom picometer size. So, nanometer is, uh, is after that. And then uh, the, what, uh, this bulk matter is larger than one micrometer. So we are manipulating matter in this scale. So you see atoms and molecules are like 0.1 nanometer. Uh, so uh, C is stipulary that was discovered by the, the Rice University scientists who would a Nobel Prize is in one nanometer. It's a 60 carbon atom uh, assembled uh, football-like molecule. And the DNA. Uh, which is very convenient uh, uh, to you is a uh, I mean uh, which is like two nano proteins are somewhere around yeah. ten nanometers and viruses usually are hundred nanometers but SARS CoV two is a little bigger like three hundred nanometers uh, and bacteria you can uh, you can uh, uh, see from optical microscope they are in micrometers red blood cells like uh, between one micron to ten micron likewise. Uh, like uh, if you take the sand, like one millimeter, we can see sand particles. But the manipulation of matter in this scale is very, very useful. See some examples. Uh, so, uh, fullerene, carbon nanotails, graphene. So, graphene discoverers also uh, in Manchester University, they were received Nobel Prize. They were awarded Nobel Prize because uh, uh, because of the importance of uh, this material. It's just nothing but the single layer of graphite. Graphite is just like a thought pack with billions of layers. So one single layer of graphite is so important. That is the material that has the highest electronic conductivity, highest thermal conductivity. So it has enormous applications in all fields, including biology and medicine. 
so why are these nanomaterials so special because uh, because unlike atoms and molecules they have fixed sizes and uh, bulk uh, material their properties do not depend on size and shape in this nano scale from 1 nanometer to 100 nanometer the properties like mechanical properties optical properties like color electrical properties electrical conductance magnetic properties thermal properties like melting point uh, and uh, other uh, boiling point and then uh, uh, catalytic properties chemical to all these properties depend on size and shape so that we can easily make these nanomaterials with required size and required shape so that you can tailor make materials that you material that you want but with the specific properties can be uh, synthesized very simply by this one actually the, the nanotechnology is very easy most of the time it's a, a, if you take the right component they assemble in your body also all these organs were assembled uh, by the principle called self-assembly no one has made those like uh, the, the proteins assembled into your heart or brain who knows so this is self-assembled through this nanotechnological pathway using self-assembly approach. So that is what we do. So if you take right component like building block, we can make various structures. Here again, if you take right components, you can make the nano structures of required shape and size so that uh, you have materials with it. You see that, I mean, this, all this is left hand side here, here. There's the one gold nanoparticles. So gold is gold color in the bar. But in the nano scale, depending on size and shape, you can have yellow gold, blue gold. I mean, ladies might like it where blue uh, gold uh, chain or something like that. And also, there are the second one, you see, melting point of gold is somewhere around 1000 in bulk. But if, when you come to nano scale, particularly below 10 nanometer, we call quantum dots from uh, 1 nanometer to 10 nanometer size, so quantum dots, because they are like quantum mechanics, is more just like few atoms. So you see, melting point is drastically decreasing to uh, from thousand to like three hundred centigrade, so that you can melt gold at uh, like three hundred degrees. Actually, I'm uh, these days there's a problem with this uh, uh, run Vienna in the Maligava. This gold, uh, uh, what they have is actually uh, gold. Uh, we have two glass plates on uh, between the molten gold. Uh, gold has been uh, sort of. Uh, uh, laminated between these two glass plates. So when you use this nanoparticles, you can melt this at 300 degrees uh, rather than in 1000. That means you can save a lot of money, a lot of energy uh, by uh, choosing this nanotechnological approach. So uh, so now we are actually reconstructing this uh, the run mirror. So that's why I was very busy uh, the uh, last few uh, weeks. Uh, trying to find the best adhesive. So we found there are a lot of uh, best adhesives now. So uh, nowadays, so we found that. So likewise, your nanotechnology is applicable in everywhere. So since time is limited, you see magnet properties, uh, electric, all these depend on the size and shape. So that you can make materials with required properties. Okay. See, applications uh, span enormous spectrum in every way. Semiconductor, stain, cosmetics, drug delivery, medicines, biosensors, athletes, automobiles, electronics, agriculture. So, you name. So, this simple technology is uh, applicable to all these disciplines. So, if, you, if I uh, like, if I elaborate that nano bio means you can make drug uh, discovery, drug delivery. I mean, we have been working on targeted delivery drugs. Now I'm collaborating with uh, Professor Guan Jaisinga of the dental faculty, who is a dental oncologist, uh, to uh, develop the uh, buco adhesive patch. So that we have electro spinning uh, machine. So what we do is we take zinc oxide nanoparticles and these are uh, medicine drugs uh, like uh, anti cancer drugs. We en en encapsulate in these nanoparticles. And then uh, we entrap these particles in a polymer matrix, like a biocompatible bio polymer, like PLGA. And uh, this polymer is made using electro spinning, so, so that you can make a nice patch and uh, attach that inside your uh, uh, the, in mouth. So that uh, the drug releases, I mean, we studied the scientists of drug release, releases slowly and steadily. 
particularly for this dental oncology situations, even drugs is quite difficult. So we can fine tune the time frame also, like um, for a week, like one day, two day, or even for a week, we can steadily and slow digging the required dose uh, uh, using this patch. So like uh, there are a lot of applications. So uh, since time is limited, what I'm going to do is I'm going to discuss uh, the applications of nanotechnology in adding value to our natural resource. We know our country is gifted with several natural resources, uh, which include very high quality natural minerals, which uh, I mean, our uh, graphite is almost like 100% pure in the middle of the way. 99.99% pure natural graphite is available only in Sri Lanka. There are only five countries that uh, have been graphite. So Sri Lanka is a country that has been uh, exporting this graphite since the Second World War. That is not a credit actually, so we are sort of exporting. But nevertheless, we have very high parts. Our part is 100% pure parts. If you want to make solar grade silicon, we parts is silicon dioxide. We have 100% pure part in very near uh, Peradri, Mahakanda, there's a big part deposit, pure parts, 100%. Right. So Sri Lankan earth accommodates precious, uh, precious gemstones, pearls, very high quality graphite. 100% pure parts, mineral sands containing ilmenite, rutile, monocyte, massive deposits of calcite, dolomite, apatite, iron phosphate, and valuable clay minerals. We have a lot of resources. We can't be a poor country. So you can see these some minerals found in Sri Lanka. Beautiful uh, gemstones, pearls, and then all kinds of these minerals. Uh, so we, uh, I mean, we, we, we did research on converting almost all these minerals into highly value-added nanomaterials for various applications. So due to time, I will concentrate on few things, but we have converted dolomite uh, into uh, uh, precipitated calcium carbonate and magnesium oxide nanoparticles, and they are very, very, I mean, uh, non, they are non-toxic, so very friendly with us. So we use this hollow nanoparticle to entrap anti-cancer drugs, who uh, like targeted deliverance chloride. And not only that, so cancer patients have this uh, uh, metal ion uh, deficiency because the cancers take a lot of uh, uh, materials to them. So therefore, the, the, the career, calcium carbonate or magnesium oxide gives calcium minus and magnesium so also. That's a dual kind of treatment. And appetite, we have appetite, uh, we have powerless appetite. So we converted this uh, impure appetite into highly pure hydroxapatite nanoparticles. And, and use, your bone is made of hydroxapatite nanoparticles, uh, uh, nano, actually nano needles like this, just like a uh, uh, bundle of BD, uh, wrapped with uh, collagen, uh, collagen uh, uh, polymer. So we, we, we made these nanoparticle uh, structures on custom-made prosthesis, I will show you, and even after getting all these ethical, uh, biological testing and all these things, ethical clearances, which even transplanted in soldiers uh, those days together with Dr. Sudhavira. So, and then ilmenite, uh, ilmen we are ilmenite, so uh, what we do is we, like, we export our ilmenite to peanuts, and then we put, we import uh, titanium dioxide as paint in massive quantities. Paint based, white paint based is titanium dioxide. So, so we developed uh, together with uh, Professor Chandra Rudwas, the vice, cha vice chairman, who is one of my students in Sabaragam uh, now. Uh, so he, uh, together with him, we developed very low cost, like I'm um, usually reach 1000 degrees, here 160 degrees. A method to uh, using mechanical method to break this ilmenite structure and make pure titanium dioxide than pure uh, uh, iron oxide nanomaterials and then quartz to solar silicon. Okay. See, uh, I'm not going to go into too much of details, uh, scientific details. If you're interested, we can discuss all this later. So, it's powered appetite, so we powdered it, and then uh, just by uh, the uh, simple. Uh, Using urea as a as a as a as a fuel, we burnt it and removed fluoride, and we got really nice uh, hydroxapatite, pure hydroxapatite. So, and then we use uh, titanium. Yeah, I mean, there are two materials that are used in making prosthesis. One is stainless steel. The other one is titanium alloy. Titanium ninety percent, six percent aluminium, and four percent vanadium. So, in both, 
we develop techniques uh, for uh, atomized fiber, uh, spray fibers to attach these nanomaterials onto this process. And then they know we throw this technique, the RBIC, a more patch of technique, we test it. So, next one, please. See, see these are group, including uh, Professor uh, Dr. Suravira and then engineers, Professor Ranavira and, and myself, uh, group leader. We developed this from the first question for that girl uh, who lost her elbow due to, uh, due to elbow joint due to a uh, previous accident. Uh, you can see that. Uh, and then uh, once you develop this prosthesis, so I mean, we had a lot of uh, meetings. So the Dr. Sumavira and his team, although they are very busy, they used to uh, come to all these meetings in, uh, in our chemistry department. And also they organized meetings in uh, teaching hospital where are they here? And uh, then uh, finally, we made this prosthesis to her uh, dimensions. Uh, first, what you, what you do is, I mean, doctors give us CT scan data, MRI data, and X-ray data. We have computer scientists there, and they convert this data into 3D figures. And then uh, we have design engineers here, uh, like Professor Ranavira leading, and, and then Dr. Herat, uh, Dr. Herat Light. And then they designed it to one micron accuracy. And then we have production engineer, Professor Vakirana, and he, uh, then the, this uh, computerized program, we can use that in a, a computerized lathe machine. Uh, to cut this tail uh, steel. Actually, when when we when I wrote to this uh, German industry where they produce medical grade stainless steel and saying that we are doing research, and they send me a block of stainless steel and block of uh, titanium metal free of charge. That was very good. And then we made this first uh, first these uh, using uh, this stainless steel, and then uh, I uh, then I reproduced this uh, like I mean, your body doesn't like for inmate. You know much better than I do. So therefore, we have to fool your body saying that, no, it is not a foreign material. This is a real bone. So I, I reproduced the structure of bone using hydroxyapatite nanoparticles. And instead of poly the collagen, surgeon seals polymethyl methacrylate, poly PMN, this polymer. So then this is, a, this is the one that, uh, that has been like, I mean, uh, the, uh, the structure introduced, like, just like bone. And then uh, doctors, did, doctors did the surgery. And then transplanted. Within two weeks, she was able to go to school, and uh, she was from diagram a very poor girl. But then, uh, doctors uh, actually uh, after surgery, uh, uh, there were a lot, a lot of uh, I mean, consultations, and uh, then uh, and we uh, and they were told us that I mean, this girl passes eight days and English says so something like that. So we were very happy for a poor girl. Otherwise, she could have. Uh, Done any education at all like this because the uh, right hand. So then there was a man with a uh, 55 50, 50 year old man with a massive cancer in his knee. So Dr. Suravira told me in the night, Garmini, there's a problem. Amputation is the only solution unless you help us. Then I called Professor Anavira. So Professor Anavira is a very good man. I said, why not come in? Let's go. We, so we have, I mean, we, we, we got the ethical skills for the materials also. So we are, we are not scared. So materials uh, we have the ethical clearance, so we didn't have any time to get the fresh ethical clearance for the next device. But then, uh, of course, I mean we made that one. So it took about eight and a half hours, and by the time when we uh, came, it's early in the morning. Uh, like doctors have just removed the, uh, the cancer, massive cancer you see in the in, in the video next, and then we gave the prosthesis. So transplanted. So we saved his limb, and doctor saved his life. He is still alive. The uh, next video, please, to detail. So enjoy.
designed uh, the ways of like uh, locking so once uh, the leg is uh, the when, when the child is moving when leg is standing so this uh, one from one place to the other automatically with that mechanical force it goes so that it naturally expands so we call it telescopic prosthesis actually we do that one of those things but uh, unfortunately we couldn't find the right uh, commercial partners to commercialize but this is very important thing because using our own natural resources and uh, iron also we can make here stainless steel but hydroxyapatite we have plenty not hydroxyapatite we know the technology so we can make prosthesis and actually we can even even export prosthesis for uh, the uh, the foreign market too also so next one please 
uh, you see the prestige market if, if i talk in terms of uh, values global market prestige is uh, uh, the basis around usd 6.11 billion in 2020 and its expected reach uh, usd 6.39 billion in 2021 those days so growth rate of uh, of 4.2 uh, percent we are talking about huge market like six billion usd market so if we get together like these the right place medical faculties like uh, our uh, professors in Europe and uh, these uh, indigenous people we can get together and develop these things uh, actually nowadays of course i mean you can make this indigenous type of uh, materials they are much more valuable in the uh, in the in the western market Next so graphite, we made uh, you, we collaborate uh, Bogla graphite. My good uh, friend uh, uh, Professor Kumar and Professor Peter are now the director of the uh, our postgraduate in science. So we uh, and together with this uh, expert, uh, the, the CEO and the chief engineer of Bogla, we converted this uh, Bogla graphite into expanded graphite and graphene, particularly the the base graphite. So we, when they if, if, when if, when they when they harvest graphite from the uh, veins, uh, they mechanically explode first, and then uh, this uh, then the is it veins in massive rocks. So yeah, rock pieces a lot of graphite attached to them. So when you visited there, we saw a lot of rock pieces of graphite uh, piling there and uh, making a, an ideal ground for mosquitoes. So we thought of recovering this graphite without rock pieces. So we we took some of those things and uh, acid solution actually. Uh, so we developed a solution, and then when you put that in there, and, and graphite pieces delaminate and go into solution, and we can take the rock also uh, for building purposes. So uh, then uh, we autoclaved it, we get graphite structure, as I told you, it's just like a part, you know, years of part. So if you expand this, uh, this initially is like uh, 0.3 nanometer, 3 angstrom. So what you do is we expand uh, this interlay. So that is a very light material. So if you completely exfoliate and take one layer uh, by one layer, that is graphite, right? So when you when you make this one, is enough space, huge space now for materials to go in. So what we did was, I mean, when excess well, ship uh, disaster came, so I was in the committee. So we had this expanded graphite, and then when uh, I mean these are uh, like uh, in the sea, these are. Uh, this, these kinds of things happen very naturally. In, for example, only one thing near Sri Lanka, but near Japan recently, three of those things happen. So, and it's a lot of oil spills, not only, I mean, waste uh, the uh, good material, but also we pollute our dam. So, the, when you put a graphite, graphite doesn't like water, it likes oil. So, the oil uh, floats on water, so patches like. So, when you put this uh, mat containing expanded graphite, Oil selectively can go into that uh, space, a lot of oil can go in. And then you take the mat and squeeze in some container and take the mat back to get it uh, more. So this oil recovery. So we, I can show you quickly here. So we have patents also for these things. See, this is that, uh, what, what uh, uh, can you say? This is something. See, uh, just to demonstrate, we put some uh, burnt oil here. So oil onto water, and as you see, oil density is low, so it floats on water. And then I just put some uh, some powder of expanded graphite, and stir, just using glass. And you will see that all the oil particles have gone into the expanded graphite. No. Next one, please. Right. So, market the global oil spill management market size is US dollars. Uh, 131.10, yeah, 131.16 billion in 2015. So, this is the uh, so his market is increasing like you are talking about like 200 billion market with our graphite right so we are using graphite for uh, uh some applications but not as high tech as not high tech actually important applications uh, very uh, valuable applications. 
So we should get together and do all these things to develop our country. We have the knowledge, we have the resources. Only thing is we have no coordination. So if we, if we do that, then we can go ahead. And we don't have to borrow money from anyone if we use our resources in a correct manner. Okay. I'm not going to go into details of these scientific things. Definitely produce and characterize using various techniques. Next one, please. Graphene market is, uh, I mean, graphene is developing now uh, for very high tech. So we can, uh, we can we, this is a transparent conducting of sight. You uh, have on these ponds, uh, these screens, uh, televisions, etc. Chlorine dot in FTU. But if you use graphene, the, the atomic layer, the, you can make, make it make it a roll. Your phone, roll and put it in. And television, you can roll. Computer, you can roll. Bendable, rollable, because it's one atomic layer then that we need. So we can, so I mean, graphene is useful in drug and discovery, drug delivery, and many other things. So we are talking about uh, uh, 1.5 billion market in 2025. But the sure with this high tech application, this market will go uh, rise very, very uh, highly. Come not just like 1.5 million. So, as I said, uh, together with uh, uh, Professor Udawath and my colleague uh, Rohan uh, in geology uh, department, we, so we use this very low uh, temperature, uh, take, take 170 uh, degrees, and rotating autoclave, mechanical energy, uh, to uh, create this uh, strong aluminite structure and make the pure hydrocarbon dioxide and pure uh, iron oxide nanomaterials. We have Once a week washing means you 
lot of energy cell environment is also there. So these textiles, so we collaborate three days to make these textiles and uh, just before this COVID came. And then we knew how to make antimicrobial textiles. We knew how to make uh, super hydrophobic, that means uh, water repellent textiles. And we knew how to make uh, like material that can destroy uh, not only bacteria, viruses also. So then when COVID came, when the, when the country is like closed down, I actually, I couldn't stay. So I talked to uh, the, the, uh, the, the vice chancellor, vice chancellor said, I can't give you permission to come because uh, this is this is coming from the, the highest authority. Then I talked to police, but he said, uh, you talked to uh, the DIG. So then I talk, uh, spoke to the DIG, said, I can't stay at home. I want to develop something uh, to, uh, to protect people. Then he actually he got the permission from the then president also. And then uh, then uh, DIG told me, sir, you go to uh, Perajini police, you will get the, uh, get the permission certificate. So when I went there, actually, I had a very grand <laughs> the police and then gave a gave a letter saying that Professor uh, Rajbas is working on this. Thing. So he, uh, the DIG has given permission for him to travel anywhere. So I used to come to Kalambu to do testing and within those days. So that is the mass that I developed, what uh, normally called nano mass. Next video, please. Stop that. Right, right, right. Respiron AV99 is an environmental friendly, biodegradable, low cost, reusable and antimicrobial face mask with water and blood repellency and stain resistance. It also repels and destroys any aerosolized viruses or bacteria. In this multifunctional face mask, the target has been to reduce both the waste burden and the impact on the environment. As such, cotton, a commonly available, natural degradable fabric material, has been used in three layers, nanotechnologically modified individually, to have unique, inherent properties. The outer layer cotton fabric is super hydrophobic to repel any aerosolized viruses and microbes as well as blood or any other water-based stains, comparable to a lotus leaf shedding water. Any microbes penetrating the outer layer will reach the nanotechnologically modified middle layer with multimodal antimicrobial activity. Micro and nanoparticles are used to partially block the pores of the woven cotton fabric via chemical bonding to a level of 300 nanometers resulting in nanometric range filtration. The adjustable ear loops ensure tight fitting to the face of the wearer. A unique mask design and a metal or plastic nose plate addresses the problem of air escape at the nasal bridge. The innermost layer is made up of 100% hydrophilic cotton to absorb carbon dioxide and moisture present in the exhaled air. This face mask can be reused even after 25 cycles of washing or disinfection, at least for a period of one month. The nanoparticles used in these masks are safe in a wide range of applications, including medical and cosmetic industry. High airflow tests and wash cycles have proven that the chemically bonded nanoparticles are stable and do not detach from the fabric surfaces. The mask has medical grade characteristics with high resistance to flammability, satisfactory results in differential pressure tests for breathability and is highly resistant to blood and fluid permeation. So actually we got the certificate from Sars-CoV-2 which is the only place where we could take, get the testing for uh, Sars-CoV-2 uh, viruses. So we got the certificate saying that this uh, middle layer fabric destroys SARS-CoV-2 and 99.9%. Uh, .9%. They never say 100%, 99.9%. Nine so we have that certificate. With that certificate, like, we have tried for uh, in the mark, in the mark <laughs> certificate. Uh, they, they were talking about giving that certificate for a long time, but they had delayed, I don't know, for any reason. Anyhow, I mean, 
they, they had a very good like uh, uh, market in the local market, and a lot of people bought. And uh, then uh, those who wore this mask did not catch uh, this uh, COVID. And we had a lot of orders from other countries, but unfortunately, uh, without this affair, we couldn't send. But the production was also limited. So we couldn't produce in huge countries. So the countries that we produced were sufficient for the local market. So I mean, we can't blame any. So we at least uh, we wanted to uh, protect our own people. This is the first thing. So we, uh, then I collaborated with many industry studios. So I went there. So knowing that, so we made this glass uh, uh, antimicrobial. And super hydrophobic likewise so that i mean this is these industries are the our economic harm so when we give our uh, when we so if you want to uh, retain in the uh, in the current market we need to add these uh, special functionalities to these things chemical resistant gloves so now uh, we develop gloves big gloves like this using this we can operate touch screen so we need, all what we need to do is to introduce like Small amount of conductivity, not high conductivity to uh, uh, electric shock, but small amount of conductivity. So, using filler nanoparticles, so some nano, uh, graphene nanoparticles, we can uh, we develop these uh, gloves. Then, with these gloves, you can operate your uh, touch screens quickly. Right. The market is, uh, is very huge. You see, uh, 3.4 billion likes. So, let's run. Uh, so this is antimicrobial pigment that we develop with uh, the lung fat transformers uh, uh, galvanizers on. So this one actually during COVID time, so with this pigment, we mix it right in that side paint and painted the walls of the uh, 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 the COVID board of uh, oh my God, oh my God, uh, hospital. And then of course, I mean, for the first wave and second wave, there were no deaths. In there, but we couldn't uh, reapply because this uh, antimicrobial print also we tested and uh, we didn't test for fast, so too, but uh, RSV virus and bacteria, bacteria 100% dis uh, destruction, RSV 100% destruction. Uh, uh, yes. So, this market is huge, quickly uh, finished. So, finally, I'm going to show you that uh, together with my student in, uh, uh, in ITI, Industrial Technology Institute. So we are developing this, we develop all these apparatus like this uh, high temperature electrode. So the, his, he developed this uh, the electrolyzer and the electronics and everything. So what we do is using our parts, we make uh, solar grade silicon. So solar grade silicon is very, very expensive. So we convert our cheap parts into very value added material. Next one, and I'm going to finish. So the electrodes and all these things we make. Uh, but a uh, code gen, you know, the, the latest technology, sports car, the uh, code gen, uh, the function. So he gave us a, uh, several projects. A lot of people are working using uh, to develop the uh, battery for two reasons. One to store uh, solar energy, the other one is to use that in this car, this car center. So we are developing blow battery. So electrolyte is flowing all the time so that the Voltage, voltage remains constant even if you draw current. Okay, uh, finally, uh, we can skip. So, like, we, we also work on uh, like uh, things related to you, like targeted delivery of drugs using nanomaterials. See, uh, see we have published uh, in very high index journals like General Materials Chemistry. So, all kinds of uh, doxorubicin, loaded magnesium oxide nanoflakes uh, for uh, treating cancer as well as hyper hypomagnesemia. And then this is how we study the release kinetics. And of course, actually, we also work on natural products like curcumin. Curcumin uh, in turmeric is a, it's an antimicrobial, anti cancer, and anti diabetic material. So uh, just for these two. So we developed a uh, cream uh, using this uh, curcumin uh, isolated from uh, turmeric. And then uh, we published two papers and both in the OECS Omega, American Chemical, and our pages are from uh, our article. See, both them. So this is on one uh, thing, and we extract this uh, berberine from uh, uh, the, the venue, uh, that plant. 
uh, and also many other things. So we can get together and do more work. I openly invite all of you to collaborate with us, and also I'm going to share good news. Finally, because I'm supported by US Air Force Research to do basics. And these are uh, the, the uh, Asian offices in, uh, in Tokyo. Uh, the uh, chemistry uh, granting uh, person is uh, the uh, the chair is uh, Dr. Todd Trotin. He'll be visiting us uh, on March 26, this month 26, and he wants to give more. I have got uh, two two hundred thousand USD for strand and bought three equipment and a lot of even undergrads. These days undergrads have problems, so I so I pay undergrads to do uh, research also. RAs and PDRA also most of those over okay. again. And uh, another grant, uh, 180, so it's 380,000 USD is a huge amount. So somewhere around 200,000 USD, you can easily get. They give for fundamental studies, so you can say that we can do these fundamental studies of natural products that are used in iodine medicine. So I will definitely uh, uh, bring them to you, sir, uh, if you give us permission. So we will come on uh, April, and they'll be coming, to, uh, they'll be going to uh, Pera Denia and then to Uwala, sir. Uh, then uh, they'll be uh, going to Columbia University. On the way, I can uh, I can take them to here and then discuss with them official matters. So that's, I mean, uh, if uh, any uh, colleague is interested in getting a research grant, so you can discuss and get like 200,000 uh, USD grant so we can buy equipment, our race, and do work. So I will definitely I will make sure that that will happen on uh, maybe they are going on April first or second. So one of those days I will inform you, right? And then uh, then we will talk to uh, Todd and get some grants. Thank you very much again for this uh, wonderful opportunity that has given on uh, and privilege also. Sorry if I have taken a little bit more time. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much for the presentation and the question for taking us into the world of nanomaterials and nanoparticles, and especially for introducing to us the wonderful applications of it in various fields. I'm sure the work you shared today will be a fountain of knowledge for us all. Now we have reached a significant moment of today's symposium, which is the launching of the proceedings of the International Research Symposium on Multidisciplinary Approaches in Indigenous Knowledge Systems on the 1st, 2024, mm -hmm. organized by the Gampa Vikramaj University of Indigenous Medicine. For this special occasion, I kindly invite the Vice Chancellor, Professor Ranjan Mikhamisi to the podium. And the Vice Chancellor will be accompanied by the Conference Chair, Dr. Pamela Jagger. Next, to pay tribute to our guests for sharing their valuable time with us and for encouraging us with their presence today, I would like to respectfully invite Ms. Rajina Dikmasamidaka, the Vice Chancellor, to give away the tokens of appreciation to the following dignitaries. The guest of honor. Emeritus Professor Darmini Semenau. I would now like to invite our keynote speaker. Senior Professor Damini Rajapaksha to, to accept the token of appreciation.
We believe that it has been a significant event, marking the inauguration of the Spring 2024. While awaiting the beginning of the technical sessions, to conclude the inauguration ceremony by presenting the word of thanks on behalf of the organizing committee, I would like to invite the conference secretary, Dr. Jitya Vijay Singh. Calling all Vice Chancellor GWUIN, Professor Ramjana W. Sinuratna, Her Excellency Senior Professor Chanita Yelianadi, Ambassador for Sri Lanka to the Russian Federation, Emeritus Professor Gamini Sena Nayaka, Senior Professor Gamini Radhapaksha, Deans of the Faculties, Heads of the Departments, University Academic and Non Academic Staff, Distinguished Guests. Ladies and gentlemen, as we reach the end of the inauguration ceremony of the Second International Research Symposium on Multidisciplinary Approaches in Indigenous Knowledge Systems 2024, which is a key research event within the university's annual calendar, it is my duty to extend my humble gratitude to each and every individual who supported us in making this event a great success. First and foremost, I am sincerely thankful to Her Excellency, Senior Professor Janita Lianagui, Ambassador for Sri Lanka to the Russian Federation, and Emeritus Professor Gamma Sena Nayaka, former Vice Chancellor, University of Rome, for gracing our event as the guest of honor. Further, I also extended my deep sense of appreciation to the eminent keynote speaker, Senior Professor Gamini Hadapaksha, University of Peradenia, for shedding light on the symposium theme from diverse perspectives, drawing his vast expertise and experience. Moreover, I immensely thankful to the Vice Chancellor of the GWIM. Professor Antonio W. Seviratna for the continuous administrative support rendered leading us to the victory. The representatives from the sponsoring companies who are witnessing the inauguration of uh, IREX 2024, we thank you for the support extended to us to make this event possible. Hope we would be able to maintain the collaborations relationships we built for many years to come. Especially, my gratitude goes to our official electronic media partner, TV Derana and other Derana 24, main sponsors, Sri Lanka Ayurvedic Drug Corporation and Nature's Beauty Cosmetic Limited for their generous contribution to make Alex 2024 a reality. In addition, I would also like to thank the following companies for sponsoring our event. People's Bank Yakala, the International Institute of Knowledge Management, IPCA Laboratories Limited, GPV Lanka Private Limited, Kimson's International, National Savings Bank Yakala, Avon Farm Kemper Private Limited, Sarasavi Bookshop, PNT Trading Private Limited, Fine Tech Technology, NOVA Biomedical System Private Limited, Microtech Biological Private Limited, Markada Private Limited. Organizing this event was a truly a great teamwork by many personalities. We only see a few of us today here, but there are many behind the curtain. So I had the best team to organize this event successfully. It, it is with immense gratitude that I mention Dr. Kamalika Jayatilipa, Symposium Chair, and Dr. Ranta Hevagi, Symposium Co-Chair, and all my subcommittee members, uh, university administrative staff, and academic and non-academic staff members, and also our own students for their unwavering support provided throughout the entire process. Last but not
not the least. A special word of gratitude is also extended to all internal and external reviewers, editors, session chairs and co-chairs, and the media team for their numerous contributions and untiring efforts to make this event a reality. This time, we received over 200 submissions and 100, 150 number of abstracts out of them were selected upon a blind peer review. Today, 126 authors will present their research findings. Congratulating all presenters and participants and thanking each of for you for attending the IRS 2024 and bringing your expertise to this event. I would like to wind up my speech. I hope you find IRS 2024 interesting and thought provoking. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bajasitha. Now we have reached the end of the ceremony. We express our sincere gratitude to our distinguished guests and our gathering for gracing this occasion. To conclude today's inauguration, please rise for the national anthem. mentioned that refreshments will be available. We kindly request the presenters and participants to visit the new academic building. For clinic and administrative staff, members of the university, refreshments will be provided inside the new academic building.
Kindly note that we will be resuming with our technical session at 10 45 a.m. So please kindly be at your designated locations. Thank you for being with us today at the inauguration ceremony. We hope you have a productive and insightful day. Thank you. Oh,